From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to another edition of Chicago Newsroom here on Can TV, where we're going today to devote our entire program to team coverage of the impending winter. It's been the, it's been the big story in the media this week. Oh my God, we're going to all die in Chicago and we're going to, we have to even consider moving apparently because it's going to get really, really cold. <laughs> or we can just kind of say, hey, we're Chicagoans, we can deal with it, right? We can handle it. It's, it's just been really funny to see how much of the, uh, of the coverage in the last few days, especially television coverage, it gives you a chance to go back to the library, get out all the footage of the Lakeshore Drive thing and go back to the photo files. Well, welcome to our program, the non-storm edition. Our coverage has just ended, and now we want to talk about a few other things. We have Kate Grossman joining us again today from the Chicago Sun-Times, editorial page deputy editor. Glad to have you with us again, Kate. Thanks. And we have also joining us for the first time, Terry Mazzini, who's the CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, also known uh, very well to Chicagoans as the former interim CEO of the Chicago Public Schools for, what, was about six, seven months you did that, right? Glad to have you with us today. Um, there has been uh, uh, there's been a little bit of news in the last few days uh, in Chicago, Kate, and one of them was the uh, the, the head tax, Rahm Emanuel, as you have on your front page today, scratching <laughs> one off the list. Uh, what does this mean? Is, is he really serious about this? Can he do this? I mean, I don't think he does anything that he's not serious about. <laughs> so I'm guessing he is. <laughs> So, you know, what he's it is. He's not a big joke. No, anymore. not really. Yeah. He tries to be funny sometimes, <laughs> but it usually falls a little flat. Um, so what it is, is this, so this head tax, which I guess it's a one dollar or $4 a month for each employee. And mm. apparently it's hated among, you know, all the city business that's been around, I think, for maybe 20 or 30 years. I guess. Oh, okay, longer. So, yeah. um, and uh, he, in, during the campaign, he pledged to roll it back. Um, over, I think, a four-year period, and now, yesterday, he introduced in the city council on Wednesday that he wants to cut it in half, so mm -hmm. make it from four to two, and then phase it out completely. I but think by it, I mean, I, it's just—it's weird. Uh, obviously, we're talking about you know half a billion dollars in shortfall in the next budget. He says he's going to figure; he's got it figured out. He knows how he's going to handle that, mm -hmm. and now he's adding twenty-three million dollars more uh, deficit on top of that because that's how much less. Is going to come into the coffers and taxes, but right. well, he hasn't offered an argument. I mean, there it, there is an argument to be made that obviously, you know, if you drop taxes, that potentially you know encourages growth potential and mm -hmm. hiring. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, that argument is. I'm not sure how much that carries, but right. there that is an argument, and so there's the potential there. And yeah, yeah. you could argue just another drop in the bucket of $656 million <laughs> right. deficit. What's, What's another, another 23 20, million? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do think that there's a. Uh, for another panel on another day, there is a very interesting conversation about whether a business would choose to leave Chicago or not locate to Chicago because of this $4, uh, is it? Uh, $4 yeah, $4 tax. a month. $4 a month tax. Well, anyway, he's doing it. Uh, he can check that one off of his list of things that he said he's going to do, and the budget is going to be released in a few days, and that's going to be a very interesting thing to watch. We have a distinguished guest on the panel today because you have uh, you have an interesting position Mr. Mazzani you have been on the outside of education in Chicago as a funder from the co community trust you've been on the inside as no less than its CEO now you're back and you're kind of a, 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 a sort of a, a go-to guy for wisdom and, uh, <laughs> and, and you know just sort of general ideas about what we need to do I want to start with uh, a, a conversation, a speech that you had. Catalyst had an event uh, about a week ago, week and a half ago, uh, and you spoke at that. And you talked about the global challenge that faces our kids in the Chicago public schools today. And I just thought it, it was just so fascinating to see some of these numbers. I mean, you're talking about um, the the uh, the GDP in China, they're happy about the fact that they've got it down to 9.5 percent. So they're talking about this just incredible growth that's going on, and we're talking about if we're lucky, we're kind of flat. We're maybe not 
we're not falling behind. That's about the best news you can give us. So talk to me, if you would, about a world where, to, to quote you, we, Chicago, and I guess the United States, we're standing still in a world that's moving forward rapidly. That's exactly the point. And for people to start to gain that understanding that the challenges we face, the conflicts we've had with school reform in Chicago are irrelevant to the real issues ahead. That as China has been doubling their GDP on a regular basis, uh, they're poised within the next 10 to 20 years to match the total GPA, uh, uh, GDP sorry, of the United States uh, for that. They have been investing 17 percent of GDP in education, and in their new five-year plan, they have increased that to 20 percent of oh, GDP. Oh, and, and what about us? We're doing about the same, yeah. aren't we? Uh, unfortunately, no. When I came back, and I was fortunate to be part of the uh, return trip that when President you, you visited you went to here, China. You actually uh, had with, a chance. Yes, to with the delegation from the Walter Payton High School, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, 16 remarkable students, six really talented teachers. Uh, and there we had the uh, privilege to meet with the president, with the minister of education. He was sharing their investments in education, and they see that as the key to their future. Mm -hmm. And that's something that President Hu Jintao mentions over and over again for that. So come back here, I check with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, uh, all in less than 5%. Uh, and so even though there are critics who say that money isn't the answer or we're spending far more than any other country, the fact is on a percentage basis we're spending a lot less and we're not spending it on the right things. I think that part of the Obama jobs package to invest in new facilities is really critical to give state-of-the-art laboratories science labs for students, internet capacity to modernize these facilities like we'd expect in a successful business practice, uh, to invest in our teacher quality and to be able to be very respectful of the profession of teaching. This is not, we do not want to get into viewing teaching as a low wage commodity. Uh, that is a dead end for our student advancement needing to be much more intentional about investing in principles, we know that they are the difference maker for high performing schools. Mm -hmm. We know that principals who have extended mentorship and practicum like medical school preparation, that they are far more successful. These are the elements that we need to be able to compete internationally as our students. It's not can they meet the ISAT exam, Jean-Claude has, has basically deflated that balloon. He mm. put up very honest and straightforward data that shows that meets and exceeds an ISAT is a meaningless predictor of future educational attainment for students. It's only the exceeds level that means anything. And he's called it out and said in CPS, 17% of the kids are at that level uh, for that. So if there's a way to sort of succinctly sum that up, about 17 percent of CPS kids are at a level where they, where it would be logical to expect that they would do well in college and maybe be able to go out and compete in this brave new world. That's exactly right. I, that's, that's a very low number. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that Mayor Emanuel, uh, Jean-Claude Brizard have this one window of opportunity to establish a new baseline uh, one reason why we commissioned the consortium, the we meaning in the Chicago Community Trust commissioned the consortium to do that 20-year retrospective, to understand the real progress or lack of progress mm -hmm. through the era of decentralization, mm -hmm. the Paul Vallis tenure, the Arne Duncan tenure. Uh, our intent was not to critique, but simply to give us Evaluate. a fair reading yeah. of where we, we're I, at. I want to I reserve a, a big chunk of our time to talk about that, about that study and what was discovered there, and obviously your role in it. Um, but, but I don't want us to get too far away from this 17% number and this, this GDP thing. I mean, Kate, this is where the, this is the intersection of politics and education. I mean, the, um, the zeitgeist in our country today is we spend way too much 
money on teachers and education. It's a waste of money when we could be spending that money giving tax cuts to the job creators. And I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not try, I'm trying not to be too snarky about this, but, but there is, I, seems to me anyway, there, there's a, there is a general feeling in the country that education is a kind of a waste of money. We spend way too much of our money on it. I mean, I'm sure there's a segment that feels that way. I mean, I think that, and that's particularly in the moment we're in now where, you know, every level of government is just bleeding cash. I mean, we're the deficits from, you know, city of Chicago on up to the smallest municipality are just in terrible straits. Um, but, you know, to your point about China, I mean, and this is what President Obama has tried to argue, that you, you know, we can't just be about the moment. You have to be about investing in something to create a different kind of economy. I mean, I'm no economist, but there's, <laughs> our economy it seems to have, you know, is withering on the vine. We need to invest in a different kind of economy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everything that we see happening in the Chicago public schools, you know, in the end is always about money, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we want to have a longer school day, but we want to have a good longer, quality mm -hmm. longer school day. And so to do that, you mean you've got to hire PE teachers, you have to hire art teachers. You can't pretend that by adding another 90 minutes without any more resources, it's going to be much different than it is now. I mean, all of these things, and again, you know, people always argue you can't just throw money at the problem. But the fact of the matter is that we, we spend, we don't spend very much on education. As a result, it's harder to recruit quality people to go into education, especially if it's a very challenging setting, which it can often be in the Chicago public schools. Um, you know, it should be, you know, like in China or Finland, where, you know, the top tier of our universities should be, should be going into teaching, and they're not. I, I guess my attitude about this is if, if we, the United States of America, if we can't make a significant uh, investment in our future, then screw it, let's just turn off the lights and give ourselves back to England or something and admit we can't do this. I mean, this is not, this doesn't seem, this just doesn't seem right somehow. What's going on here? I mean, you, you hang out in these circles, Terry. You, you, you talk to people who fund these things. What's gone wrong here? What, why, why are we, why have we become so timid? Where I'm looking at back at the last decade, uh, framed by No Child Left Behind, that put enormous emphasis on accountability measured by standardized test scores. That's where I see the wheels came off for us. Mm -hmm. uh, that there was, uh, I accept accountability in a profession. Accountability is usually peer enforced, mm -hmm, and there mm -hmm. are professional standards mm -hmm. for that. Uh, to use a narrow metric of a standardized test that uh, d under represents the full range of learning and development that young people need to be competitive at world-class standards, mm -hmm. that has truncated the education so that we put so much resource into reading and math classes and getting people up to a bar that was set way too low. Mm -hmm. uh, give you one example, because of the requirement for highly qualified teachers, the unique structure of Chicago schools having K-8 elementary schools the upper grades historically were departmentalized. So you had in grades six through eight a math department, a science department. Those teachers had a elementary credential, but they didn't have a math or science credential. So with No Child Left Behind, they went back to self-contained classrooms. Huh. So you had a teacher who was oh. not proficient in math uh -huh. now trying to teach all the math subjects. Uh, one of our funding strategies was to invest in preparing teachers with the algebra credentials so that eighth grade could be teaching algebra. That's the track to go to calculus by 12th grade and on to college level mathematics. That's what we mean by elevating the standards to world class standards for that. The common core curriculum is going to do a lot of that. It's terrific that we've got 46 states that have come forward and agreed to that. That puts us much more on par with other nations that do have a national curriculum, but it goes against our grain of individual local control right. at the school board level, at the state level. I think there's, there are two other variables. I mean, one is, you know, the country has changed, 
right, over the last awesome. 20, 50 years. I mean, it is a much more diverse country and people coming in, quite honestly, with lower schools, lower skills in the school system. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you can't do the same thing with a different population and expect the same results. Mm. So that's a big factor. And then the other part in terms of, you know, w why people are saying just fooey to the schools, we're not going to give you any more money, is sort of related to this University of Chicago Consortium study. You know, what they found was that over 20 years through three different waves of reform, when you look at reading scores, particularly for black students and for students in schools low achieving, they're basically the same as they were in 1991. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty darn depressing, right? Yeah, it I mean, really you pour is. all, yeah. you know, this, you try this, you try that, you know, and flat. Were you surprised by that? Um, I mean, the, these, the, the yeah, report came out I like was. last Thursday, about a week ago, right? And, and I mean, it, it, it seemed pretty shocking when you read it. I was surprised and discouraged, mm -hmm. you know, as I think most people would. Uh, I think it and was. And I ask you that as somebody who covered Yeah, for a because long time. you like to think that some of these things have added up <laughs> to mm -hmm. some change. I mean, I think it was important. I think it got covered a little bit because it was an average. It said on average reading scores didn't go up. But really, when you look at the numbers, it's, you know, white students, Latino students, it's Asian students, their reading scores not, didn't leap by any stretch, but did go up. It was really mm -hmm. the subset of black students mm -hmm. and students at low achieving schools where you have the the flat scores. Yeah, and, and that's most concerning here because the future workforce is going to be African American, Latino, and Asian. Uh, so it's, uh, it is a very different world as you said and yet historically our schools have not been successful in educating minority students to Absolutely. high levels yeah, of achievement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because of, of that, that's what's distressing about these results is to show that despite concerted efforts, the achievement gap has increased. Right. And there's also, I mean, and I should point out, because there was some really good news in that study, which got always as the second point, and I was guilty of it too, but, you know, the conventional wisdom has been for the last 20, you know, 50 or 10 years at least that elementary schools were soaring, right. high schools flat. Right. But right. this report just completely turned that on Driven the head. Driven by the mayor's press office. Because right. Because that, yes. that was the message they were giving all right. this time, that elementary schools are getting better and better. Right. And I mean, and it, you know, in their defense, it was borne out by what we saw on the scores. But what the consortium at University of Chicago found was that you can't, I won't bore you with all the details, but you basically can't use these scores to make year to year comparisons. Mm -hmm. That's just a faulty way to mm -hmm. look at it. They're fine. The tests yeah, are fine. Yeah, They're yeah. a single snapshot. Yeah. But anyway, but the high school graduation rates have gone up considerably and the ACT college entrance exam have also gone up, which is so that's very positive. But I mean, but the, the ACT went up one full point, which I guess is is significant. It's, it's a, a big gain scale. in that type of yeah. It is. Of I mean, it's still you, you low. You were happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay. I mean, it, we do, we are on the right track. So. Did something happen in Chicago's high schools below the radar that nobody noticed was going on? That that they they figured something out? They were because presumably they were still taking these same kind of frankly low quality inputs from these from students that were not achieving well and were graduating. I think you said the graduation rate went from half to about two thirds, right? So they were able to keep them in school. They were able to get their tests up a little bit. Did something happen that can be replicated? Well, this is what I'm wondering when you're talking about these are district-wide averages, is I'm saying that as a possible outcome of true improvements in individual student achievement in the elementary grades during the last decade that then translate into better preparation. Mm. It's things like the ninth grade on track indicator that the district uses. Uh, much more intentional about bridging the transition from eighth to ninth grade for that. I think it also is reflective of the past mayor's practices of investing in selective enrollment in magnet high schools. Mm -hmm. So that we, you know, it used to be that there were three great high schools to go to in right, Chicago, right. then there were five. Now there are about ten that yeah, people yeah. would agree that, yeah. yeah, I could send my student, my child to Well, it's school. interesting you raise, I didn't interrupt, interrupt you, but, but see, that was kind of my first thought when I heard that, was, well, now we do have, I mean, objectively, we can say there are a number of really fine high schools in Chicago. I mean, you know, as good as any you'll find in the country. Maybe they just are doing such a great job that they're dragging the average up. I mean, 
uh, without naming names, we can all think of high schools where probably there hasn't been any improvement, and in fact there might have been decline over the last 10 years. So maybe, maybe on average. Um, maybe you could address this. There was something that I believe you said, maybe I read it somewhere else, but something about how when you look at, when you draw, I'm going to mangle this so you'll have to rescue me, but when you draw this bright line <clears throat> that we expect our schools to achieve at this line, this is the 100% line, and you have a whole bunch of schools and kids that are at the 98, 99% line, it doesn't take very much to get them up two or three points to get them across, and then they're a success story. They're no longer a failing school. So you can say that we've had this great success at bringing a certain number of schools up to up to standard when in fact they really didn't improve all that much and maybe others improved equally but they didn't get to the bright line I mean that's kind of the problem that we have when you're trying to measure everybody against some kind of arbitrary right, well that's one of the things that the consortium said so it, there was this line and so you could get a bunch more kids over the line which is basically what happened and that's what and that's sort of the test prep focus that you were right, talking about. Right. You know, they focused on the kids who were, you know, at the 23rd percentile right. so they could get them over. But that, what the consortium did was they looked at the average scores mm -hmm. and saw that really they hadn't Hadn't changed, <laughs> changed all that much. You know, so, which is very useful inf information. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, in context, Terry, with your, with your really sort of eye-opening speech about the, the global challenge here, I mean, we spend so much time arguing about whether the teachers are going to get their 4% or you know, whether we're going to add 90 minutes to the school day and this, that, and the other. And we just don't seem, I don't hear too many people talking about the, yeah, but you know, this is a tempest in a teapot. We've got, this is, this is, this is us and this is the world. I mean, where are we? We're, you know, we're just, we're not, we're not up to snuff with the world. It, as we've been engaged in the conversations around school reform, I, I see that we're at a tipping point. I'm starting to hear more people focus on world-class standards, what are the best in the world doing. It's much like in this country when we finally woke up to the competitive threat of Japan mm -hmm. in the late 70s. And all of a sudden, what did the best companies in the United States do? they started to send teams around the globe to right. be benchmark how did Toyota get to quality? How did other organizations get to that? We now don't have this preeminent status mm -hmm. as the world's mm -hmm. great educator. We now have to, with a little more humility, look to the rest of the world and say, how are yeah. they achieving yeah. that? Yeah. And I'm starting to hear that conversation go on. Uh, for that, and it is going to change the conversation. It's not about 90 minutes. It's about what we're doing right. in the 90 minutes. Right. Mayor Emanuel is very clear with that. He says it's an opportunity, but it's not the solution. Well, it, it, th I mean, there's a there are a couple of things in the news this week that sort of collide into that. I mean, the 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 number of schools that have voluntarily agreed to the 90 minutes remains low. It's I don't know what the latest 13. score is, 13 or something. But um, I, I wanted to have you guys address something here. Uh, I've said on the programs many times that before I came here, I, I worked in media, and then I also worked for Mayor Daly. I was in his press office for a while. As part of my responsibilities there, I did a lot of video work, and I spent a great deal of time following Mrs. Daly around doing things on After School Matters and saw with my own eyes some really dramatic and amazing stuff. And of course, I realize that this puts me in a position of appearing to be a shill for that, and you'll just have to, you'll just have to take it one way or the other. But I saw literally thousands of kids who were doing uh, sculpture and theater and computer repair and kind of following their muses, and not in anything that you would even consider to be close to a conventional school environment, although they were in their own schools, but they had different teachers and they were doing a lot of things. Now, the programs come under a great deal of, con of, of um, scrutiny and, and uh, the, the $900,000 and it's raising all this question about where the funding comes from and everything. But I wanted to a ask you if you could address the bigger picture of when you talk about increasing the school day 90 minutes, what is the point of increasing the school day 90 minutes if you're not going to be doing something that's really rich and 
life-changing, not just more of the same. And I don't hear enough conversation about that. And Kate touched on this earlier in this, but that's where uh, during my tenure we had brought together principals and teachers to come up with some models for that, and the new administration's taken that. But it is, it, it's about adding art so we get the creative uh, development of creativity and skills in students. It's about adding world language. We no longer can pretend that English is the only language. That's for sure. it, every student needs a world language for it. It's about physical education to create healthy young people uh, to address the obesity epidemic. It's about these hands-on engaged activities. It's a full set of allowing kids to learn in other ways than being strictly at the desk learning uh, wrote lessons about reading and math. Can you want to add? Well, I mean, I think I think on its face there's value there's j value in extending the day. Uh, you know, we can debate the teachers union numbers or the Chicago Public School mm -hmm. numbers. Our, the day in Chicago is short. It's mm -hmm. too short. So, even if you just brought back recess, mm -hmm. gave kids more than 20 minutes to shove a sandwich in their mm -hmm. mouth and run on the playground, there's benefits there. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we won't see them immediately on test scores or maybe even ever, but there's benefit to the socializing, the running, all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So, so, and that's, so that's a starting point. So I think the day should be longer, even if we can't f figure out how to make it enriching. But obviously we should <laughs> make it enriching, and that's what's been so frustrating about the conversation this fall. I mean, Rahm Emanuel has just been, go, you yeah, know, 90 yeah, minutes. Yeah. Or you know, yeah. be damned, basically, yeah. and right. and he said, you know, he has said, let's just put this highfalutin discussion put to the side. Let's just move, you know, and about what it should yeah. include, yeah. and yeah. Uh, it can't be put to the side. Yeah. It, and and it, it goes back to the true cost of education. Uh, Maggie Daly, her motives were absolutely pure and for the kids. I worked with her. I watched her. Yeah, you know, that to me is indisputable for that. But she was doing a workaround because we were not willing to pay the go. true cost right. to provide right. education enrichment for all children, mm -hmm. and that's important for all children, right. for this extended period of time. And so she was doing the workaround. Uh, now we've got that. We knew during my tenure that schools could not be prepared to create the student schedules to hire the quality teachers to teach these new subjects mm -hmm. in the three-month mm -hmm. period leading up to the school district. All the great teachers are already hired in other districts then. It, unfortunately, the public may not want to hear it, the political optics are wrong, but you needed this year to be able to transition into this to bring on quality instructional minutes. And that's where we have to leave it. I'm really sorry. I, uh, we had a one-hour show condensed into a <laughs> 28 minutes here. But uh, there's so much more to talk about. And you can see, my list is very long. We didn't get to too much. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Mr. Mazzani, Terry Mazzani, joining us today from uh, the Chicago Community Trust and former CEO of the uh, Chicago Public Schools. And, of course, from the Sun-Times, uh, 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 Kate Grossman joining us here today. Again, as always, and I really appreciate your time, Kate, too. Thanks so much for watching as you've been watching watching Chicago Newsroom right here on CAN TV. It's a community service of CAN TV and you can find us and all kinds of other programs right here on cable, but you can see this and other programs online at cantv.blip.tv. You can check us out there. You can subscribe on iTunes. You can listen to the audio podcast. Lots of good things to do. And I'm glad you watched us and we will be back next time with another edition of Chicago Newsroom right here on CAN TV. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks for watching.